And why is that important? Because this talk is going to be about machines, like big machines, big vessels. And what does data science have to do with all of it? How do you do machine learning for machines, for actual machines? So in today's talk, I'm not going to present to you a Python library that's going to change your lives or a machine learning algorithm that by the time you leave this door, you're going to be the richest man or woman alive. What we're going to talk about today is a concept that I find really, really awesome. And hopefully by the end of my talk, all of you will find it awesome and want to do it yourself. So my professional way began a few years back. I was a programmer for a lot of products in my organization. And then I did some um, navigation algorithms for autonomous vehicles. And I moved on to managing that project because it was super cool, doing ways for, for ships. And currently, I'm at a position of a, uh, an R&D group lead. And I manage three uh, software teams. And my story begins about two years ago. It was uh, my first month at the job. I was sitting by my office, uh, deleting emails, drinking a cup of coffee. And one of my uh, project managers comes into the office. And in my organization, some project managers, they have to go um, sail, on sailing duty, because they know how to sail ships. And so they have to do that part time. And he was one of those, uh, he was one of those guys. And he's been sailing for many years. He's been sailing for almost 10 years. And so he came into my office and started ranting about the last time he sailed. He said, I was sitting at the ship, and I couldn't listen to, I couldn't do my, my job because I had to listen to all the engines around me. And I was trying to be a good friend, and I said, oh, that sounds horrible. I wish there was an app that could listen instead of you. But in my head, I was screaming, like, 2019, Israel is a startup nation. What is this that a person has to sit inside a ship and listen to engines? Makes no sense. And that was when I started thinking that maybe we should do this app. Maybe there's something to it. Now, when it comes to software projects, I pretty much know my ground. I know how a project is supposed to begin. I know what I'm looking for. I know what the, 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 stepping, the, the stones are on the way to, the, to the, the, the end product. I know somehow uh, what I'm supposed to get at the end. But this project was completely different, and I had no idea what I'm looking at. Um, because I had to learn stuff like maintenance and engines and things I never, never, never had to, to learn before. And I began by looking at, the, looking at the word maintenance. What does maintenance mean? And I found that in my organization and many other organizations that rely on big vessels, um, two types of maintenance are being done. The first type, you probably all know it from your cars. Um, we, we have to go, at least my car, I have to take it to the shop every 20,000 kilometers. I have to take my car to the shop in the morning and leave it there for a few hours. And they clean the brakes and they look at the engine and everything's fine with the engine. And eventually, when I take it back, it's supposed to be in better shape than it was before. And they, they, they basically look at all the mechanical pieces and they try to prevent anything from happening. Same goes for ships. Um, but we all know that it's, it's never enough. And I can give you an example, a fresh example from yesterday. I was trying to get to Mexico, and what happened to my airplane? The most ironic thing that could happen, that's right, an engine failed. And, and so we know we have to look at another type of maintenance, which is breakdown maintenance. What happens if we're driving a car and suddenly we see white smoke? We have to fix the fault that has already happened. So when it comes to cars, it's not that terrible. Um, maybe I'll take an Uber, maybe I'll drive, I'll take the bus, whatever. When it comes to ships, it's a little bit more complex than that, because if a ship breaks, then it can't perform its missions, and it has a lot of missions to perform. So maybe other ships will have to perform its missions for it. And what about spare parts? What if there aren't any spare parts within the country? You, we have to order them from abroad, and then we have to wait for them to arrive, and then we have to wait for them to leave customs. And then when they're finally on the ship, we have to take all the technicians that perform their own jobs, and now they have to perform only this. They have to fix this fault. So you see it's one big mess. So preventive maintenance doesn't prevent all types of faults. Breakdown maintenance is just the worst case scenario. Isn't there anything in between? Well, I'm glad you asked, because there is. There is this amazing concept called predictive maintenance. When predictive maintenance, it says, OK, Let's just predict the fault. It sounds amazing, right? We can just predict 
that something is going to break. And this way we can make preventive maintenance um, more efficient because we know when something is going to break and we have to attend. And we, we, we also know when something is okay and we don't have to do preventive maintenance at all. And we can skip the entire part of breakdown maintenance, which is amazing. So like many amazing things that have happened in the past, uh, predictive maintenance also began uh, at NASA. Somewhere in the beginning of the 90s, a bunch of mechanical engineers were sitting around the table yelling at each other, and we're not doing maintenance well enough, we're losing money here. And then one of the mechanical engineers, uh, he was sitting in the corner, and he said, okay, let's, let's test this theory. Let's see what, uh, if we're really not doing maintenance well enough. And he took 100 engines, uh, space shuttle engines, and he took some data and he did some equations. It was really the beginning of the beginning of predictive maintenance. And he discovered that out of the 100 engines, only four were actually, actually needed attending to. So the other 96 were perfectly fine. What a waste of money. And at that point, they said, okay, let's, let's pursue this predictive maintenance thing and see, see where it takes us. And how did NASA do it? Um, the way NASA did it was using physical models, which is physics. Um, they did uh, heat, heat uh, equations and movement equations and all sorts of mechanical engineering equations. And they took the, and they took the data using uh, mechanical engineering tools. And the way they could do the equations was only because they knew the engine well enough. Which means to, you, to use a physical model, you have to know the engine, everything you need to know about the engine. How it behaves, what it's supposed to do, what it's supposed to behave like in, in every scenario. So there isn't one way to do a physical model. There isn't one way to use just, just a certain uh, uh, set of features. Uh, there are many ways to do it. Um, the most common ones are vibration analysis, which looks at the way the machine vibrates. Um, oil analysis, which looks at uh, the contamination of the oil of the engine. And acoustic analysis, which looks at the friction between, uh, between the engine, the, the sound it makes. Um, and Basically, what, we, what we're looking for for the physical model is we're looking for the rules to tell us exactly what we want to know about the data, the rules, uh, the rules of the engine. Now, for our project, we started looking at vibration analysis. We said, okay, this is the most common, this is the most common method. Let's, let's look at vibration analysis. And we saw that we have a few problem, problems with vibration analysis. The first problem, we didn't have a mechanical engineer on our team, which is a big problem. And the second problem was that not every mechanical engineer is a vibration analyst. This is something I didn't know. And there isn't a tutorial on YouTube saying, hey guys, today we're gonna learn how to become a vibration analyst, unfortunately. So that was a problem with vibration analysis. And then I said, okay, let's look at what NASA did. Maybe NASA did it in a bit of a smarter way. And yes, NASA did. NASA did it better because NASA automated the way they um, take the data, they collect the data. They automated the way they process the data. The only problem is still, at the end, when you're sitting at your screen in the control room and there's a warning shot, I have to have a mechanical engineer sitting there telling me exactly what the problem is. And at this point, an image of me sitting next to a mechanical engineer came in mind. And it just, it just seemed a little bit impossible that for each and every one of the steps of the project, I have to have a mechanical engineer holding my hand. I have to have him holding my hand when I collect the data. I have to have him holding my hand when I process the data. And eventually, when I actually have faults, I have to have a mechanical engineer throughout the process. And then I said to myself, isn't there a smarter way to do this? Isn't there a way for me, a computer engineer, and my teammate, who was an electrical engineer, to do something together? Isn't there a way to avoid mechanical engineering because we don't have people just lying around waiting for, um, for us to pick them up and, uh, and uh, have them uh, do our job for us? I'm glad you asked because there is. So we said, okay, big data, machine learning, data science, it's all stuff we do, you know, every day. But we never thought of performing, uh, of performing machine learning uh, algorithms on actual machines, on actual engines. Um, and, this and these data science models, they don't say we are completely obsolete mechanical engineers. We still need mechanical engineers for the prior knowledge we all know is very important. But for collecting the data, we need them. For pre-processing the data, we need them. But that's it. As of that point on, we only need people who understand the data. And that's the whole promise of using a data science model for this problem. So at this point, you might ask yourselves, 
why are you doing this? You had a method that was working, and for 30 years, people, people have built experience on it, and they know exactly what they're doing, and they know every step of the way, and they know what's going on. And I was still feeling a little bit uncomfortable for pursuing a whole new way, but I explained it to myself using the face recognition problem. I said, okay, for the face recognition problem, everybody understands why we move on from rule-based to learning, right? Um, it, it's the same for ships. Uh, maybe a long time ago, ships had three engines on them and everything was fine and I could write an algorithm that distinguishes the sounds and distinguishes the behaviors and I could do it. Today's ships are huge, huge. They have hundreds of engines and they have hundreds of systems and each system affects each engine. Everything affects each other in this huge ecosystem and there's also the people on the vessel and they also create, create noises and they do stuff and they don't know what they're doing. And, Anyway, it's a whole big mess, and I, I wouldn't be able to write an algorithm by myself to do that, and that's why I explained to myself, okay, let's do a learning algorithm. And so the easiest way for us was to say, okay, we'll just collect the data, and we'll throw it into an unsupervised method, and everything will be fine. Uh, because unsupervised methods, as you all know, they, all, they take the data and they, they look at patterns or they find anomalies, which is the, 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 the two things we were supposed to find here. Um, we wanted to look at clustering um, because we had sensors that were collecting data from multiple engines, and so clustering could really separate the engines one from another. And we wanted to look at anomaly detection um, because anomaly detection is once we took, once we took uh, um, info on a single engine, we could actually look for anomalies uh, inside and see maybe something, uh, maybe something is broken or maybe something is going to be broken soon. The only problem was we didn't have any data. And that's a big problem. And so if, if, you, if you come out of this talk with just one tip, is this, start collecting data, it's super important. And then we said, okay, if we can't do unsupervised, if we don't have any data, what are we gonna do? Let's look at supervised. We'll just figure it out. We'll find a data set somewhere online. Um, we can't scrape the web because it's machines, but maybe somebody has already collected a, a data set at some point, and maybe we'll buy a data set from, from a company. We didn't know what to do, but we said let's start at this point, just understanding, just, just trying to get a feel of how this project is going to go. And for the supervised, we also, we also thought of the worst case scenario for us, is say a fleet has 100 types of ships, and each type has 100 ships, and each ship has 100 types of engines, and they're all different from one another, and we don't have the human resources to tag that much data. But we said, okay, let's try and figure it out for one engine, and then, and then we'll think about that. So the first thing we had to keep in mind before we entered this data science project is we had to have a few focus topics that are only related to predictive maintenance. And the first thing we had to keep in mind was sensors. Because as I said, we can't just scrape the web for, for data. We have to have sensors all over the vessel. And there are a few problems with sensors. For one, they're very, very expensive. And if NASA could put 21 sensors on each and every one of their engines, my organization is not that rich, and we could put just one sensor on three engines, or give or take. And uh, some other problems is uh, architecture, uh, architecture problems, because I, I can't place a sensor wherever I want uh, on the vessel. I mean, sometimes I just can't do it. And um, the less sensors I put, is, uh, the, the readings are less accurate. And the, most, uh, the, the biggest problem, really, is the cybersecurity problem. Um, because most of the sensors nowadays, like most of them, they have uh, Bluetooth or Wi-Fi technologies, sometimes both, and we can't use neither Bluetooth nor Wi-Fi, so we had to find sensors that have neither of those technologies um, to move the data. The second thing we had to keep in mind was the data set. So we didn't have a data set, as you recall, so we took NASA's data set. We were lucky enough that NASA are so nice and they want everyone to perform predictive maintenance that they post their, their data set and it's very public and everybody can, uh, can play with it. Um, so we took this data set and we said, okay, we'll use this data set as our training set, but in parallel we will collect our own data just to make our, uh, just to make our product more accurate by using our data as the test set eventually. And the third thing we had to keep in mind was that we were looking for, eventually, uh, a time. A time. Uh, that's why we need, to, we need our data set to be a time series data. 
Um, our data, Nessa's data set has a timestamp for each and every one of the readings. And what I'm looking for eventually is to know in 30 cycles this engine is going to break. That's what I'm looking for. That's why time series data is very important here. And now when we, when we moved on to the actual data science project, what, uh, what we were actually looking for is a remaining useful lifetime. It's this RUL prediction we, we see on the screen. A remaining useful lifetime is, uh, is how, how many cycles I have until my machine is going to break. And what we're trying to do here is to minimize the, the RUL we predicted and the, RU, the actual RUL, the actual remaining useful lifetime of the machine. So the first thing we did we took a bunch of uh, models from uh, scikit-learn and H2O, regression, regression models, and we just passed the whole raw data through them. And, and we, found, uh, we found that a uh, loss function that, that is good for us is uh, RMSE because it punishes big mistakes. And we can't have big mistakes because mi big mistakes mean, means that sometimes uh, uh, if something breaks, it could break in the middle of the ocean, and that's something, it's a big no-no for us. Um, the second thing we had to do after we've passed on just the raw data without processing it is actually beginning to process the data. And we moved on to the feature engineering part. Now, the feature engineering part is a very difficult part, as has been stated before in, in the talks before me. Um, the feature engineering part means we have to take only the features that are most predictive. And for us, it was uh, temperature, for example, because we saw that engines, when they reach the end of their lives, the temperature levels go higher. And a vibration, uh, maximum vibrations, it's also a very predictive feature. And after we finished the feature engineering, which also reduced our, uh, reduced our error, um, we moved on to optimization to, uh, of hyperparameters. So we use grid search, but hyperparameters, they, uh, they um, uh, state the behavior of our, of our of our system, and you can, you can choose whatever way you want. And after we finished this part of the, just the, the, the first part of the data science, we said, okay, let's move on, to the, let's move on to, to the next step of actually looking how good our model is, looking at, looking at that. And at this point, if you do just these steps, you might look at your results, and you might say, wow, I'm so good at this. It's over 90%. I'm amazing. But actually, you're facing a very, very terrible case of class imbalance. And what is class imbalance? You probably know it from click predictions, when you have a lot of uh, non-clicks uh, and, and, and a very few clicks. So if we're looking at this problem, we have, and let's, let's look at it for a second uh, as a classification problem and not as a regression problem. Um, say we have two classes here. One class is a lot of time until the machine breaks, and the second class is a little bit of time until the machine breaks. Um, we have substantially more data of a lot of time until the machine breaks because machines, they don't break that often. And if they would break that often, we probably wouldn't buy them. Nobody would have a car in the world. And so in order to, in order to look at this class uh, imbalance and try and figure it out how, how we're going to, uh, to make this problem solvable, uh, we have our two uh, mathematical tools of precision and recall. Uh, they help us solve this uh, problem. Precision, it looks at all, um, at all the predictions, basically, at all the predictions. Um, say we predicted a, a faulty engine when it was predicted, when it was actually faulty, and we predicted a faulty engine when it was actually healthy. And as farther away uh, we get from precision from one, uh, it means that the one promise of predictive maintenance to schedule preventive maintenance more efficiently goes out the door. Because if we always say that something is wrong, if we uh, take a warning shot and we say the engine is faulty when it's actually not faulty, then we're just going to do a lot more preventive maintenance. And the second, the second tool is recall. Recall actually looks at all the faulty engines, both those we predicted they were faulty and also those we said, we, we said nothing about them. We said they were healthy when they, they were actually faulty. Now, if I have to look at recall and precision and choose one, I would definitely choose recall because as farther we get from recall, it means that our system can actually not predict a fault. And that's the whole point of predictive maintenance. I just want to skip the breakdown maintenance part, remember? And so I can't, I can't, uh, I can't win on both, uh, on both uh, frontiers. So if I have to choose between uh, the one or the second, um, precision helps me um, schedule preventive maintenance better, and recall helps me skip breakdown maintenance. So recall is more important for, for, my, for my vessel. And if we want to look at the overall accuracy of the system, we would probably use a harmonic average or whatever, uh, whatever average you choose. We chose this one because it's the most common. 
And eventually, um, when we look at the whole, uh, at the whole uh, project, we began with uh, pre-processing and evaluating a model and returning the results and you know, making everything a little bit more accurate. But when we finish this project, it's not just like any data science project. There are a lot of things we have to keep in mind when it comes to predictive maintenance. Um, first of all, the data amount has to be super huge. And it's not just, uh, it's not just uh, uh, good data we have, to have, uh, we have to have in mind here. We also have to collect um, a lot of data of actual faults. And that's a little bit more difficult, so really collect data from today and if better from yesterday. Um, the second thing is, uh, like I said before, an engine is usually healthy, um, which means when we look at the overall data sets, we have to keep in mind that um, until we set a certain threshold that's the beginning of the fault, uh, up until that moment, we would probably look at the data as constant because it doesn't matter to us uh, until that threshold. And the third thing is um, the, main, the main decision uh, to go from a physical model to a data science model is uh, that using a physical model, we assume the degradation rate. We know exactly how the engine is supposed to behave, and we know exactly everything about the engine. And so we assume that at some point it was go it's going to break. Data science, on the other hand, doesn't make any assumptions. And that's why we can figure out that something is broken um, without the, the prior assumptions of mechanical engineering. When we go into deployment, uh, actually when we went into deployment, we found that we have a bunch of problems. Um, if it's a legacy system that had, uh, that had no place for big data or we didn't know what to do with it and we had no DevOps teams to actually deploy the system and we had no ML expertise within the teams because nobody's, uh, nobody's an MSC in my teams unfortunately, and the client didn't understand why it's important, and therefore we had no budget. So we could look at all these setbacks and say, okay, so we're not doing this project. <laughs> Screw this, I'm not doing this. But what we did was we turned each of the setbacks into a solution, and we chose appropriate, uh, an appropriate approach to, to actually deploy it uh, on our legacy system, and we turned each and every one of the, of the teammates into a DevOps person, a little like 30% of the time, and we did a ha ML hackathon. Um, I organized an ML hackathon that um, I told the people, okay, you have 24 hours, learn how to, how to do ML now. You're a data scientist by the end of these 24 hours, and they actually created very amazing products. It was, I was very proud of everyone. And we pitched to multiple clients. Um, you know, when you pitch to multiple clients, then Everybody wants to win. Each, each of the clients want, wants to be the first one. And therefore, we, by interesting the right people, we got the budgets we needed. And if we try to sum, sum this project up, our project is just a, a, per, a perfect solution for a very small problem for a certain company. But it doesn't mean the predictive maintenance can't be done uh, in other places. Um, if you look at the, at the automotive industry, each and every one of the R&D centers has uh, a division for predictive maintenance, and if they don't have a division, they have to have one because everybody has it. Um, but it's not, just for, it's not just for space industries or automotive industries or for, for uh, maritime industries. Predictive maintenance can be done everywhere, and market researchers say that by the end of 2022, uh, the rise is going to be of 40% annually um, until we reach uh, $11 billion. That's a crazy amount of money, and I'm going to take over the world with predictive maintenance, and hopefully all of you will also be smart enough to go in now, because now is the right time. Um, but actually, there are other impl implementations uh, that everyone can do. Um, the link below here is the, it's the data set, the Nessus data set, the public data set. You can all just start playing with it. Um, so, for example, one of my friends, they had, uh, they had to map out all the hard drives in her company to do predictive maintenance on the hard drives and see when something is going to break. And um, if we look at an industrial example, so uh, Siemens in 2016, they had a pilot with Deutsche Bahn, uh, which is the uh, German uh, rail company. Um, they had a, a predictive maintenance for the ICE trains. And Microsoft, they have, uh, in the Azure, they have a predictive maintenance uh, um, library, and you can all just start playing with it. It's very, very convenient. And uh, by the end of 2022, the same market research said that almost 70% of all, of all predictive maintenance implementations are going to be cloud-based and non, not on-premise. Ours is probably going to stay on-premise, but... 
And if at some point in the past I was like, I wish I could go inside my car and see exactly what's going to happen so I don't have to get stuck uh, on a road, on a random road at, at a random time at night, it's not something of the future, it's already in the past. So we have to go in there now. And at this point, I'm hoping everybody understands why predictive maintenance is the most awesome thing possible. And I invite you all to do predictive maintenance with me. Thank you.